Hey everyone, this is Bob Martin, the RC sub guy with the Nautilus drydocks.com and I am going to be talking about something that is uh, almost painful in that I am actually betraying uh, my previous methodology of watertight cylinder exclusivity and I'm going to be talking today about building watertight boxes and specifically watertight boxes for big subs. So as I bear my soul to you, uh, bear with me, we're going to be talking about some cool stuff for big boats. So if you guys have been following my channel, and of course you have, you'll have noticed that I've done uh, dozens and dozens, uh, if not hundreds of RC submarine builds and almost without exception, they were all constructed thanks to the use of a water tight cylinder and typically that cylinder uh, is removable from the model and it offers a lot of advantages over a dry hull boat. Uh, here's an example of an older style watertight cylinder. This is, this is probably the first commercially available watertight cylinder on the market. This was engineered and put together by a gentleman by the name of David Merriman III. And, uh, and he really opened up the hobby of RC submarining because of the availability of these watertight cylinders. So you can see that these are kind of integrated uh, units. You've got a, a ballast system that's completely integrated with a motor compartment and servos. And as you can see, everything is completely removable from the model. You've got a clear Lexan tube that allows excellent visibility to the interior of the cylinder to spot leaks and see what's going on inside. And the other more modern uh, watertight cylinders have integrated battery compartments as well so that actually the entire module is self-contained. You just drop it in, hook up your linkages and away you go. Now that's a little bit different than the old school methodology and one that probably currently the Europeans are still favoring and that is a dry hull boat. And then basically they segregate sections of an RC submarine and put lids on it that you have to bolt down with about a bajillion bolts. Um, advantage to that is that you got lots and lots of room to work inside. It's very easy to lay out all of your components inside your RC submarine. The bad news is it's hard to get into. Uh, if you don't use a clear cover, you can't see what's going on inside. And with a very large enclosed volume inside that watertight cylinder, you need a lot of weight to offset the buoyancy. So dry hull boats tend to be very, very heavy. What I'm gonna be talking about today is something halfway between those two, and it was introduced uh, to me more in force, or it opened my eyes, I should say, by a gentleman by the name of Ed Tortle, who did a beautiful 48 scale skipjack and he shared with us his uh, experience and wisdom on the forums that I have, the link to which is on my website. Be sure to check it out if you're interested in the hobby. So let me show you what I built for a big, big RC submarine. So part of the reason that I did this is because I came across an exceptionally large RC submarine hull. It was a George Washington Carver uh, submarine hull in 148 scale, which put it at a massive nine feet in length with almost a nine inch beam on it. So it's a massive boat. Typically, I would simply, uh, you know, put a cylinder together, drop it in and call it a day. But because that boat is so big, it does not lend itself very well to a large watertight cylinder. Um, what it does offer, however, is an exceptionally large amount of room inside to do cool things. And I'm going to show you the system that I came up with, thanks to Ed's uh, insights shared on those forums for the George Washington Carver. And it will also be utilized on that massive German Type 21 RC submarine that you have seen in previous videos. So uh, let's take a look at the system and why I chose to go with it. All right, you can see the entire 
command and control system for a gigantic 48 scale George Washington Carver remote controlled submarine right here. And for the size, this is actually exceptionally compact. Uh, we have a rear command and control module. We've got a large, very large central ballast tank. And then we have a forward uh, dive module. The idea behind this is that each one of these modules are self-contained and arranged in such a manner that, that if there is a catastrophic failure of anything within it, uh, water can fill, but all of the components are actually raised up quite a bit, so everything should still be functional. Additionally, there is no actual conduit running between the two modules so if there is a really catastrophic failure that water will not flow from the flooded chamber all the way through to the unflooded chamber they're completely stand alone units we'll talk about the ballast tank uh, first here this is actually some uh, clear paint cans that I found online and uh, they are uh, one gallon each so I have a two gallon ballast tank now realistically that's probably going to be a lot more than the George Washington is going to need to get up into surface uh, buoyancy but as I am not going to be finishing that model out myself I gave the new owner lots of reserve buoyancy now if he doesn't need it all the cool thing is these ends just like a paint can pop off and you can add foam inside to reduce the capacity of the ballast tank. So really cool feature. It, uh, it works out really well because it's completely clear. You can see exactly what's going on. Now it's vented by a 12 volt large aperture electronic solenoid that's been waterproofed. And uh, basically the bottom of that tank is uh, completely open. You can see some large holes in there that allows uh, the water to enter the ballast tank when that valve is opened. And there's passages between uh, the two tanks that allow air and water to flow between. So very similar to the previously mentioned Dave Merriman cylinder uh, that does the same sort of thing. You can see those holes uh, on the bottom there and the vent valve on the top. But this is much larger scale with an electronic versus mechanical vent valve. All right, let me run you through the design of the ballast system that I've got for this boat and that will be for the big Type 21. I did a crude drawing here to try and explain it to you, but it is rather simple if we take a look at it. Basically, what you've got is a, a main ballast tank with an electronic vent solenoid at the top of it. To dive the boat, that vent solenoid is opened, air escapes through the top of the ballast tank, and water enters through the large holes in the bottom. The model becomes heavier and submerges. When the vent solenoid is closed, the model will retain that level of buoyancy, be it neutral, negative, or slightly positive. To surface the boat again, uh, an air pump is kicked on and what that does is it draws air from the pump module, blows it through the uh, hose into the bottom of the ballast tank, air displaces the water and it surfaces. Now what that actually does is it creates a partial vacuum in that pump module and that is uh, not ideal. Eventually that air pump will stall out certainly well before being able to completely blow the ballast tank. So what we need to do there is incorporate an equalization valve. So just a few ounces of positive buoyancy is all it takes to bring that model to the surface. Once it does, the sail breaches the surface. The snorkel is now uh, above the surface of the water and the equalization valve is opened. As soon as that happens, the vacuum from the pump module draws air from the surface, equalizes the pressure in that pump module, and that air pump can continue to blow out the ballast tank until it's completely empty and the model is in full surfaced trim. Pretty cool. 
Um, it's very simple. I like it a lot. The only thing uh, that may give some people cause to pause is the fact that if there is a grievous operator error in that they open that equalization valve while submerged, you're going to suck water into that ballast pump uh, module and you're going to partially flood it. Uh, not a good thing, but the way I've gotten around that, I have isolated the control for that um, equalization valve on a completely different control. Um, you have to make an intentional decision to activate it. And uh, if you happen to do that uh, in error, you were not thinking and uh, maybe syncing your model will teach you not to do it next time. <laughs> Obviously, there's ways of getting around it. There's water detector modules that can be wired in that will cut power. Uh, if that model is submerged, but uh, I think that is a level of redundancy that is not required. Uh, I'm a big fan of the KISS principle, so uh, we're going to try this out and see how it works. These are clear watertight boxes that you can get on Amazon. And again, all of the information is on the forums in the uh, thread that Ed had started. Be sure to go there and check it out. Theoretically, these are actually rated to 80 feet of depth. So obviously for our purposes, these are more than sufficient. The really cool thing about them, unlike a dry hull boat, where you have to undo dozens of bolts or screws, you simply open these latches and the whole thing opens right up for you. So taking a look uh, inside there, We'll kind of run through what we're looking at. We have our uh, main drive motor. And if I'm not mistaken, this is actually the uh, motor from a heater in a car, like a, a, an air conditioning motor that runs the, the fan there. So it's got a lot of poles. It's very efficient. It's completely suppressed from electronic noise right out of the box, and it's very, very torquey. It's perfect to push that gigantic four inch diameter prop on a George Washington Carver. I've got a, uh, a union going into a stainless steel drive shaft that runs through an oil light cup seal in the back there. And similarly, we have uh, our rudder and rear dive plane servos running through 1 8 cup seals as well. We've got a main power waterproof connector on the back corner here that feeds power to everything. And then looking up on the lid, we've got our 40 amp electronic speed controller from Mtronics, our six channel receiver, and our electronic pitch controller that automatically controls the rear dive planes there. Uh, here on the top, you can see some servo outputs that I have made some connections for. And these are all physical uh, connections that run directly through this bulkhead, uh, completely sealed off and labeled as to their uh, various functions that move to that forward ballast compartment. So again, this is just a really slick system. You've got really easy access to all of the components and gaining access and closing it back up again is as easy as uh, closing the lid and snapping down the latches. The last thing I'll note on this is this large plastic hose and I've actually run the receiver antenna out this hose so it runs the entire length of it. The new owner can run this down the entire length of his submarine and that will give you exceptionally good reception. The other cool feature of this is if you uncap this hose and submerge your watertight box, if you blow into the end of this hose, you can look for bubbles and check for any leaks before you put it into your boat. I use this methodology on all of the cylinders that I put together. It works really well. I highly recommend it. We have taken a look at the uh, drive module in the background here. Now we are going to look at the ballast module up front. Uh, this is a smaller container because everything uh, fit in it. And I wanted to be able to orient this vertically so that that linkage for the Fairwater planes uh, is vertical, makes it much, much easier to uh, connect all of the linkages to engineer 
all the linkages. So let's take a look at what's inside here. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly straightforward uh, arrangement. We've got a large high volume air pump. We have a linear servo for the Fairwater planes. Got an electronic switcher module that controls the outputs for the pump and for the vent solenoid. So basically one stick controls both functions through this uh, very cool HP switcher module from uh, Mtronics, which I do carry uh, in my online store. And then the last thing is that equalization valve that I talked about, and this is servo actuated. Just a small servo uh, here right now, and I've adjusted the transmitter control, so the throw is just minuscule, just enough to depress this tire valve, this Schrader valve on the end here. So I've got a sleeve that goes around, keeps everything centralized. Inside I've got a pin that depresses the Schrader valve. Uh, and basically that is how the entire thing equalizes pressure, draws air uh, through this hose, through the, uh, the snorkel hose uh, into the main chamber. And that is it. The other thing that I'm gonna mention here uh, is on the, on the back, uh, and this is uh, Quick Connect. And what it allows you to do is uh, replace this plug, which is currently on there right now. It's just a, a plug that stops anything from getting in or out. You can attach a hose. Now, the hose actually serves two purposes. And uh, the first one is that you can close up the module, throw it under the water, blow into the end, and you can check for leaks. But um, that may be a little redundant because you can also test it simply by turning on the uh, air pump and it'll draw a vacuum in there. If you leave it sit for a couple of minutes uh, and it's still got a vacuum in there, then you know you're in good shape. But the other thing that you can do is hook this up to uh, uh, an air reservoir. So another tank, another module, um, and what that allows you to do is increase the effective volume of this module so that you don't draw as high of a vacuum inside. And what I'll be sending along with the owner is this uh, Robart uh, reservoir, air reservoir. And uh, basically this is what it was designed for, uh, for air retracts, for aircraft and that sort of a thing. Uh, super light, but basically you just connect this air hose to it and uh, you basically effectively doubled the volume of the interior there. You can use this uh, for extra flotation in the model, mounting it uh, you know, high up under the surfaced water line. Uh, you're going to have to add foam anyway. You might as well make it functional. All right, that's enough bench testing. It's time to do some practical testing of this new ballast system that we've created. Uh, this, this Frankenstein monster that I'm pretty excited to try out. Uh, I am uh, in, the, in the swimming pool right now and basically I'm interested in testing out the functionality and timing of the ballast system venting and blowing cycles. I have already tested individually both of these uh, compartments for watertight integrity and they both checked out perfect. So I'm going to retain them uh, up on the ledge just because it's easier uh, for me rather than trying to uh, hold everything underneath the water. But the big thing is I've got the ballast tank uh, in the water and I've got the main drive battery or, or a big drive battery, a 12 volt sealed lead acid battery suspended from the bottom with a trusty duct tape and uh, it will uh, keep that ballast tank upright and uh, allow us to raise and lower it using the ballast system. So let's take a look at the setup. All right, everything is uh, connected, powered, and ready to go. I am going to say that I am expecting a, a quite a long vent time on that ballast tank. And the reason is, is it doesn't have a big, huge, heavy model to drag it down. So you can see it's sitting above the water. So there's no water pressure to push that air up through the vent. So it's gonna take more time than it typically would, but this is still gonna be some interesting um, tests for us to run just to see what sort of times. I may push that down uh, with my hand just to see what that does. And I'll pull out my stopwatch and uh, we'll time it and see what it looks like. 
All right, here we go. I am going to start the stopwatch and uh, hit the vent on boat. All right, the tank is half empty and we're at 30 seconds. All right, down it goes, it's full and uh, what are we at here? We are at, that was just under one minute. So what I'm gonna do now is uh, restart the stopwatch and we will check the blow time. All right, I don't know if you can see it there, but uh, it's probably a quarter of the way, maybe a third of the way uh, blown. The water level is about three quarters of an inch below the surface uh, there. And that is when the pump could not overcome the um, uh, vacuum inside. So what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll just go ahead and open that up and, uh, and we'll see what happens. Done. I'm impressed. Well, there you have it, everyone. That's an overview of this uh, modular control system. I'm going to call it the modular subsystem, uh, or MSS for short. What I'm actually going to do, if you're interested in more information on this, uh, along with maybe some wiring diagrams and uh, diagram outlining the operation of it uh, and a parts list with some pricing and such. I am going to be creating a blog entry on my website at nautilusdrydocks.com. If you head on over there, click on blog, search for uh, MSS, you should be pulling up the uh, 
article that I'll be writing on this particular system. Now, in case you're interested, and as a little bit of uh, a spoiler for that, I tallied up the cost of all of the parts that I put into this system, and it came to $616. Now, you may be able to find things for a little bit cheaper or a little bit more expensive, but it's gonna come in right at about that mark. Now, just in case you're interested, uh, that is approximately the same price as purchasing uh, a fully assembled subdriver, which is that watertight cylinder. Um, maybe a little bit cheaper because you have to add some other electronics to the subdriver, but they're very comparable. So if you're looking at this system solely on the basis of cost, um, not the best way to go. If you've got a big boat though, this is a good way to go. So with that, I am going to let you all go. I appreciate you tuning in to listen to my ramblings on this MSS modular sub system controller for remote controlled submarines. Uh, again, a big shout out to Ed Tortle who kind of uh, convinced me that this was a good way to go. Uh, thanks Ed for your help. If you have any questions or comments, I would love to hear from you. Uh, email me anytime, bob at rc-sub.com. Uh, be sure to subscribe. Head on over to my website, uh, lots of cool stuff there. So thanks a lot, everyone. I'm gonna let you go. Thanks for joining me and we will catch you next time.